Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Asiri, and my goal is to help members of the military identify, obtain, and pursue their ideal post-service career. Today is episode number 352, Veterans in Hollywood with Tyler Gray. As soon as you put a timeline on what you want to do, you've failed. Because it doesn't care. Name one plan that you've made in your life that's worked out according to the timeline that which you scheduled it. It just doesn't happen. But why do we continue to do it? You, you know what I mean? We, we feel like we want to have control, but the reality is you have a goal, you set your mind to it, and then you just keep doing it every day. And, and you know, if it happens in two years, great. If it happens in 10, great. You don't control the timing, no matter how much we think we do. Um, but I would say for most things, anything, any real goal, if, if somebody thinks they can accomplish it in less than five years, I mean, even making a business successful, like it's just, everything takes five years. My guest today has done the seemingly impossible. He went from medically discharged from the Army Rangers to consultant, director, and actor on CBS's SEAL team amongst other impressive accomplishments in Hollywood. But what sets Tyler apart isn't his incredible accomplishments, it's his attitude. In this interview, Tyler talks about how we are all equally unprepared for our military transition, be it from medical injury or after 30 years of a career. He talks about giving up control and putting in the effort, even if it takes decades to achieve your dreams. He talks about networking, about what one wants to do versus what one needs to do in life, about how a veteran is a status, not a job job title, and more. Regardless of your interest in Hollywood, I guarantee there are multiple inspirational and motivational lessons for you in today's interview. As always, at beyonduniform.org, you'll find show notes with links to everything we discuss, as as, as well as a text transcript of this interview, thanks to Kathleen Dillon. You'll also find over 350 other exceptional episodes just like this one, all offered for free at beyondtheuniform.org. So with that, let's dive in to my conversation with Tyler. Joining me today in Los Angeles, California, my guest is Tyler Gray. Tyler, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So for listeners, I want to give you a very abbreviated bio. Tyler is a consultant, director, and actor on CBS's SEAL team. He is an Army veteran who served with the 75th Ranger Regiment, 2nd Battalion as a sniper in Iraq and Afghanistan. He was medically discharged in 2005 after being injured in a nighttime raid in Afghanistan. And he spent years working in Hollywood as a military advisor. So maybe, Tyler, to start things off, anything to add or amend to that bio? Uh, and I mean, the only thing, a couple of things, uh, one, just, uh, I got hurt in 05, but I got out uh, later, but, um, but that, that's really the only, uh, inaccurate part, but, uh, yeah, no, um, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's been a journey, you know, um, to get here and, uh, no, it's, uh, it's funny when you hear your own bio, it sounds like they're talking about somebody else just in general, you know, it's like, it's always weird to hear, uh, hear yourself, uh, uh, consolidated to a paragraph, you know, so Mm. obviously. Well, I'd love to start with, um, something that's unfortunately not that unique, which is you, you know, the sense I get is you were, you loved your life in the army. This was in many ways fulfilling a dream and you faced, a unexpected, uh, departure from the military, which many guests on my show have as well. They thought they would do a career and then they, they, they had something happen that, that prevented that. I'm I'm wondering if you could share with listeners a little bit more about what your transition was like and what that was like having your life in one moment look a certain way and then another have to really adapt to a completely different life. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, before I talk about myself, I'll say just in, in my personal experience, although I guess that is technically talking about myself, but, um, you know, it's interesting because I feel like that from the people that I've talked to, I feel like whether you're, you know, get hurt and medically retired, like I'm going to talk about myself, um, whether that, whether you retire, whether you, uh, you know, get out, your time is up, whether you, it's almost like no matter how you get out, everyone is the same level of equally unprepared. 
you know, so I, I guess what I'm saying, the reason I'm prefacing what I'm about to say is I don't want people to think just because I got medically or I got hurt and then I got medically retired that that somehow made me less prepared than someone who retired after 20 years. I, I feel like everyone, I feel like transition is difficult for everyone uh, equally regardless of, um, and, and I would even make an argument that maybe for retirees, it's harder to a degree uh, more hard to a degree because they've been in for 20 years you know, or, or more. Um, so I just feel like everyone has that struggle. Um, I think to a degree, a good way to say it would be that we're all prepared, unprepared to transition um, because we don't know what we're transitioning to. And, um, and for me, uh, yeah, I, I, I planned on making it a career. Um, I loved, you know, the, as a kid, I wanted to be in the military, you know, I mean, I can, <laughs> I could send you a hundred, you know, photos of myself as a little kid, you know, wearing airborne shirts and camouflage. I mean, I wore camo to school almost every day. Um, didn't work out too well for my social life, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was always something I wanted to do. And, um, and I wanted to make a career out of it. And, you know, when I got hurt, um, where, where I made, I won't say made the mistake, but, I thought when I got hurt, um, and it's funny because I just had this conversation with a buddy of mine about a week ago that got injured. But when I got hurt, all I could think of in the hospital was getting back. And I, I, I used to say this, uh, when I get back to 100%, when I get back to 100%, I just need to get back to where I was, blah, 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 blah. And then what you realize, uh, which was a slow realization for me, is you're never going to be 100% again. It's not going to happen. Um, and what was very difficult for me was to accept um, that I would never be the way I was before I got injured. Um, what took longer uh, to realize was that was okay. Um, and, and we'll talk about that later. But, um, you know, to answer your question of, I... I pulled the plug on myself once I realized that I was never going to get back to hundred percent, which again took several years. Um, and it was surgery after surgery after surgery. And, and finally, you know, when the doctors told me earlier, when I was in the, you know, early on, Hey, you're not going to be hundred percent. I was like, yeah, I'll show you, you know? And, um, but then as the physical part of the surgery started, you know, if you don't have any tendons, you can't open your hand. That's not a matter of willing it. That's not a matter of, of over mentally overcoming something. That is a physical, it's, it's not there. The mechanics, you know, are not there. Um, and it took me time to, to realize that and realize that it was something that, uh, that I couldn't will away. Um, and when I did realize that, um, I actually made the decision, which later was, I ripped myself apart about, but I made the decision to medically retire. That wasn't something forced on me by the army. Um, that was my decision. They, uh, in my unit that I was in, uh, in Fort Bragg was, I can't say enough how, uh, uh, helpful they were and, and open to, you can have this job, this job, this job, this job. And, but for me, um, and this is, I think very critical uh, overall is, I pulled the plug on myself and the reason I did was because I joined the military to be on the ground. Like that's be the guy in the, in the fight. That's what I joined for. So when I realized that I couldn't do that job anymore, um, I use the analogy of uh, if you were hands or maybe a hand surgeon's ironic uh, thing, but if you were a surgeon and they tell you, you can't be a surgeon anymore, but that's all you ever wanted to do. They're like, you know, you can't be a surgeon anymore, but you know what? You can, you can be a nurse and you can hand the scalpel to the surgeon. Um, I think most people go, you know what? Not only do I not want to be a nurse, but I don't even want to work in the hospital. You know, and that's how I felt. Like, not only do I not, I, I don't even want to be in the military anymore. I just want to get out because my whole reason of being there, I could no longer do. It's it's powerful to hear that, and I'm kind of abstracting things to my own life from this, but um, I was just having a conversation with a friend yesterday about relinquishing control. Like, I have this view of what my career should look like, what my family life should look like, what my life should look like, and it's like trying to force everything to conform to this mold and there's a freedom and it's very difficult I'm struggling with this myself but there's this freedom of like 
letting go of that and saying like, okay, I thought my career would look this way. And, and you're, you're a, a, an extreme example of this of saying like physically, this is not willpower. Like th physically, that's not an option anymore. And having to let go of that, I think takes so much courage and so much introspection to let go of the way life quote unquote should look and start to accept, okay, you know, I have a much less extreme example, but I've got a 13 month old son. I have a, a view of what my life should look like around socializing, around getting outside. And the reality is I am homebound. I am, there is like, I just can't do the things that I want to do. And I'm sure yeah. as we all age, we'll experience that as well. Like my body is not capable of the things yeah. that I think it is. And so I love what you're sharing because both physically and career, it seems like you had to come to an acceptance of a new way of being. And I can only imagine how difficult that is to just accept a new reality. No, no I, it's extremely difficult. And, and, and it's, it's um, I'm trying to think of the best way to explain this, but it but it's also takes, I, I am notoriously impatient uh, with myself. Um, and it takes time, like what I even, what I just explained to you, that acceptance, okay, I got that acceptance. But then later, there's so many levels uh, of acceptance. Like I'll, I'll give you an example is, um, so at the time I said, I am not strong enough because here's, now that was around, this was around 2007 when I made the decision. So 2007, I made the decision. I, I, I don't want to be here anymore. I, I just, I, I'll, I can't go back to a team. Now, now here's the thing that's interesting is maybe I could have, and maybe I couldn't. And this is my time at the time. And I don't remember the numbers, but let's say there, let's say that they said there was a 20% chance. And I don't remember, but let's say 20% chance that you could go back to your old job, which they gave me a percentage. I don't remember, but it was 20% that you could go back. This is 2007. This is the height of Iraq uh, or ish. This is, you know, Afghanistan hadn't really started again at that time. It was kind of dead. Here was my thinking. They said, I said, how long will it take? How long would that 20% take? And I think it was about five years of rehab, blah, 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 therapy, you know, all this stuff. So I went, okay, five years to get a 20% chance. And I was like, by that time, now this is, you're going to laugh at this. I was, so I'm like, okay, 2012, 2012, Iraq's going to be over. Afghanistan's already dead. There's going to be nothing going on. Oh, how I couldn't have been obviously more wrong, <laughs> you know, and no, everything got uh, way more extreme and a lot more happened, but I don't, you can't fault my thinking that at the time, um, that, that the wars were all going to be over. So I was just like, you know what, everything I am not, I recognized that I wasn't strong enough as a person, especially at that time to watch my team, my unit, the military for that matter, deploy over and over and over for five years or however long I thought that was going to be, listen to what they were doing, try and support them in any way I could, but it, it would have killed, it would have slow killed me over that five years. Um, and so I got out. Um, but cut to my whole point being now I look back, could I have still done that? I, hell, I could still do that job now. You know, you know what I mean? And, and I'm like, it, I pulled the plug on myself and that took me years to be okay with. Because I didn't know. Could you, could you, we'll probably come back to this, but I'm just curious, like, walk us through then from like when you left the military to where you're at now, which seems like it, many people's dream job, but like, how did that, how did that come about? And, and I'm especially interested in kind of like the psychological component of, it, it seems like, I mean, all of us have to do this, but you're, you're an extreme example of like, you, you had to reinvent yourself or rediscover yourself or discover a new identity. And it's, it's intimidating for anyone listening to think of like, man, you, you were this. And then how do you, I mean, what you're doing now still so far away from what you were doing before. And so I'd love to hear that story of how that came about. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I do think though what you just said is actually a, a critical point. And, and I, I know this is a little, not necessarily off topic, but a little separate from what you just said, but that is, I think reinvention um, and, 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 you know, getting out of the military is a loss. Um, it's a, it's a loss. You know, if, if you worked, uh, 
you know, whatever job, you know, many jobs are jobs and they're separate from your life. Uh, but I would make a strong argument that the military is not separate from your life. Um, it is your life because it is, it occupies so much of your time. You know, a lot of people live with the people they work with. You live at work, you know, there's, it's, when you're in, by and large, it is your life and therefore it is your identity. So when you get out, your identity is gone. Um, and therefore, you do have to reestablish who you are um, and you do have to re reinvent yourself to a degree. And the reason I say that is this is a, a major thing that I realized is that veteran is not a job title anywhere in the civilian world. Despite despite what some people may feel, it's not, it's, it is a, uh, it's your past, mm. uh, but it's not, you know, being in the military, that's a job, but veteran is a status of a job you did. So you have, you can't be employed as just a veteran. You can, you, you know what I mean? You can be a veteran and do a million jobs, but that job is that job. And, and you have to, you have to reinvent yourself to have another skill and another trade and all these different things. So, um, for me, I was extremely lucky in the fact that the only two things I wanted to do, ah, okay, actually there was three, uh, military, I wanted to work in Hollywood. And as a kid, I wanted to be a firefighter actually. But, um, uh, but until I realized there's actually not that many fires now. So that kind of went away. Um, but you know, so I knew I wanted to work in Hollywood. So when I got out, um, I, I started and I had no idea what the hell I was doing. Uh, but I was very passionate and, you know, I didn't have an education in it, but I had, uh, you know, I watched a million movies and, and I really studied them. So when I got out, I just came to LA and started networking and, and, you know, trying to get jobs and, and I got some and I met more people and that cycle continued for a while. So I was lucky in the sense that I knew what I wanted to do. Uh, and I knew and then I, because I knew what I wanted to do, I reinvented myself towards that, that goal and that passion. Could you, I, I love this. This is so, uh, so vital. I think for listeners, regardless of their career path, it's probably dating back a little bit, but if you were, when you were in that phase of networking, how did you position yourself? Like, how would you explain like, Hey, I'm Tyler. This is who I am. This is what I'm looking for. Like, was, could you give us like a soundbite of how you would have explained that? Um, you know, at that time, uh, and again, I mean, at that time, uh, I was essentially pushed and I don't mean this actually negative, but I was, I was in Hollywood. I was very odd in the sense that I was, you know, in a unit in the military, uh, that I went to after I was in Ranger Battalion that, uh, had a certain name and I was kind of thrown around, uh, different circles in Hollywood because I had just gotten out. You know, so I was like this, for lack of a better term, like I was like this veteran. And again, this is like 2008, nine. So it was very, it was a, a very, um, no one had really gotten out at that time. You know, the war was still relatively new. So for somebody to get injured and get out, that was quite frankly, kind of rare. Um, and I was kind of shuttled around like, a, and I don't mean, again, I don't mean this in a negative way, but it was kind of, a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? uh, I was kind of showcased, you know, mm -hmm. Hey, he just got out, you know, he was in Iraq, he got hurt and people kind of, you know, that's, that, that's how I was introduced. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and I was, but again, that's fine. That was fine then because that was my identity. I, I wasn't really separate from that. I was a, a, a wounded veteran, uh, to, to use that term at that time. Um, because I hadn't really, you know, hell, I was still, when I first started, you know, going out to LA and Hollywood, I mean, I was still going through surgeries uh, in, I had to go to Arizona and I was still doing rehab and, and uh, all those different things. So I was very much kind of shuffled around, you know, and, and helping people with their, you know, military scripts. And, and Hollywood was very different too at that time on kind of the content that they were putting out uh, or wanted to put out for the military. Iraq was still very much a point of contention. It was just a very different time. Um, and so, you know, I didn't know a, a great, to answer your question directly, and I think this is very important. At that time, I didn't know how to introduce myself. I didn't know what my skill was. I didn't know how I fit in. I didn't know anything. Um, I allowed everyone else to tell me what I was 
and what I could do because I hadn't figured it out yet. Did you, did, was the attitude at the time, was it like, did you, did you have a sense of like, Hey, I'm looking to review scripts or do blah, 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 blah. Or was it just like, I'll do whatever you need done. Uh, yes, the latter. Um, you know, I was, you know, aware of, of military advising and, and again, that's all I, I didn't know. I, I knew I could do that in the sense, and here's the thing, and we'll get to this way later, but it's, I knew the military stuff. So I knew that I could advise. I knew that I could answer those questions. I, I knew I could do that. Um, the problem, uh, is usually what you know you can do. Um, you got to be careful with that because uh, if, if you only focus on what you know you can do, you're not focusing on what you may be able to do. Mm. Um, and, and that's, uh, you know, that's a later conversation, but that definitely in hindsight, I should have, I should have been more sure of my potential and less sure of what I knew I could do. I could do, you know what I mean? Like, but that's understandable. Cause uh, you know, you're going from a completely different world. And so I could see the, the desire to kind of cling to what you know, and maybe, especially, you know, I find this a lot of, of the people I've interviewed, we are so, uh, or I'll just speak for myself. I'm, I'm, my bias is to not commit to something that I don't know that I can do a hundred percent. Like I'm still used to that mindset of the price of failure is loss of life. So therefore, yeah. I better be damn sure that I can deliver on whatever I say versus what you're saying, which I'm trying to do more of, which is like, I, I know I can figure this out. I don't know how it's going to work, but I know I can get there, which I think we also had that in the military too. Like people are overcoming unbelievable obstacles. So we have that, but I, I, can, I can get that sense in a new environment where you would be playing it safe in some ways. What was, what was some of the first jobs that you did? Was it like reviewing scripts or was it like choreography type stuff or what, what did those look like? Uh, I'm trying to think of my very first job. Uh, I, it had to have been one of my first ones was advising a, I want to say it was a discovery channel. Like I want to say it was discovery channel. It was really weird. It was, it was a very weird job that I, uh, it was, it was like, it was, I think it was discovery channel and it was actually, um, it was a reconstruction. It was like a docu one episode docu series on, on Pat Tillman's death, mm. uh, which is super weird that I fell into it because I was in the same unit as Pat Tillman. Like I, I knew Pat Tillman, not well by any means. I've talked to him like five times, but, but I, I knew him. I had interactions with him. So it was just really surreal. Um, but quite frankly, I am so happy that the people that came to me, you know, I knew quite frankly, they couldn't do it. Um, so when they came to me, I'm like, yeah, and I'm actually very happy I did it because the stuff that I gave them definitely made it, you know, it was going to be made either way. Obviously it was, you know, it was already going forward by the time I got hired. Um, and I made it as good, as realistic as it could have been. You know, I'd served in that unit. I, you know, knew several of the people involved. So, um, but that was like my first big job. Um, and then, and then a lot of script stuff. I was working on a lot of script consulting at that time. Did you have like an, an agent helping with this or was it just I, networking? No, I, I, you know, weirdly, I've never signed with an agent. Um, never signed with an agent. I've never signed with a manager. Um, all the jobs I've gotten, I've gotten myself. Wow. Um, which is, which is another kind of misconception of, Oh, if I get an agent and everything will be great, you know, and, um, not, you know, I've had agents help me with deals. One in particular has helped me greatly, uh, after, you know, uh, but, but I've gotten every job I've gotten is basically through who I know. Um, uh, actually, you know, it's funny. Um, cause I've said this before. Um, but I think a big issue in Hollywood, uh, and, and this is the whole world for that matter, but, um, everyone says it's who, you know, it's who, you know, it's who, you know, who, you know, that's not true at all. Um, and, and I think it's interesting that, that, that people think it's who, you know, um, the term I use is it's who knows you mm -hmm. because just because you know, somebody doesn't mean they're going to give you an opportunity. They need to know you, be confident in you and be confident that you can do the job, that you can do a good job, make them look good. It's them knowing you and your potential and not the other way around. 
that gives you opportunity. And that's why networking is a really bad, like, hey, what's going on? Hey, Bob, great to meet you, Bob. Hey, let's take out. Oh, hey, let's do lunch. And then all these different things. And it's like, nothing's ever going to come from that. Things don't come from networking. They come from relationships. Um, and I've built solid relationships with people. And that's, um, I, I'd say, you know, that's kind of what's gotten me here is I've not tried to network. I've tried, I know I used that phrase earlier, but I've just tried to build friendships with people that I would work with or hang out with. And then once you're friends, of course, you're going to want to work with your friends. And that's been, uh, for lack of a better term, the, the secret to, to kind of how I've gotten uh, where I have in this industry is just not trying to build, um, not trying to network and get jobs, but just by building solid friendships. What, what, what did your life look like at this period of time? And like, how long did that last for? I'm, I'm, I'm imagining that it's kind of like you work for a couple of weeks, you have a couple of weeks off and it's kind of like project to project, but could you get like, um, give listeners a sense of what the day to day looked like? And was this, you know, a period of years or months or how long that, that phase lasted? Uh, uh, I mean, years, 10 years. Uh, oh. about. Yeah. Well, Eight, eight or nine years. Um, you know, at that time it was all movies. I, well, a, a couple of TV shows, uh, but, but mainly movie that then I kind of went into film. Um, and film is, couldn't be more sporadic. I mean, it's just, it's, I mean, I got a call one time and they're like, Hey, can you leave, uh, Monday for seven months? You know, like that's just how it goes. So, um, yeah, it was, it was extremely sporadic. Uh, I would probably do one project a year for several years. Um, uh, and then, and then, you know, it just started increasing and increasing and, and, um, but, you know, really, I, I probably would say for seven to eight years, it was, it, it was, there, it wouldn't have been possible to, to have made it a full-time thing. So I had, you know, a full-time job or full-time ish job, um, but it just, you know, it's like everyone says, you know, overnight success takes 10 years. Wow. So it's one of those things where, you know, when you're, you know, a, a thing that I like to say uh, is however much time you're in the military, that's how much time you're behind everyone when you get out. Well, you know? it, it, and I, I'm guessing that would be a piece of advice is that like, if you're going to go down this path, you have to have another consistent source of income. Like you have to have a pay, yeah. way to pay the bills. A absolutely. I mean, I was, uh, you know, for about the same amount of time, my main job was bodyguarding. I did oh. bodyguarding for, uh, almost, uh, again, about, eh, about eight years. Um, and that was my, you know, I, in the Hollywood joke, I, I say bodyguarding was my waiter job, you know, because that's, that's what I did. And that too was sporadic. I mean, it was generally more, uh, contract work. I only think I did like an actual job job one time for like two years, but, um, but it's one of those things where, you know, you just, you goes back to what you were saying earlier. I think a real misconception, excuse me, that people have is that as soon as you put a timeline on what you want to do, you've failed because it doesn't care. Name one plan that you've made in your life that's worked out according to the timeline that which you scheduled it. It just doesn't happen. But why do we continue to do it? You, you know what I mean? We, we feel like we want to have control, but the reality is, you have a goal, you set your mind to it, and then you just keep doing it every day. And, and, you know, if it happens in two years, great. If it happens in 10, great. You don't control the timing, no matter how much we think we do. Um, but I would say for most things, anything, any real goal, if, if somebody thinks they can accomplish it in less than five years, I mean, even making a business successful, like it's just, everything takes five years, you know, and, and, and I didn't know that then. And I thought I was making a lot of mistakes, but the reason, uh, I guess what I am saying that you need to do is you need to not allot a time goal and just keep doing it because you don't know when success is going to happen. And had I have stopped at five years, I wouldn't be here now. I would have, you know, quit and then been saying, yeah, you know, I tried, I gave it a shot. Well, what is a shot? You don't know what the timeline to success is. So don't, don't assign a line, a timeline to it if it's something you actually want to do. It, it makes me think of a video that I saw where it was like some conference where they were interviewing really successful YouTube influencers mm. and everyone was sharing why they were successful. And this guy got up 
one of the influencers and said, he's like, here's this lottery ticket that I got that won. And the way that I did it is I took a quarter. It had to be from 1975 and I scratched in this certain way. And that's why I won the lottery. He's like, you know, the point of this is you, you can't, you can't engineer these things. All you can do is give yourself more time to buy more lottery tickets. And I love that sense of like, you can't, that's you can't enough. engineer these things. Like you, yeah. I think that what I hope listeners take away from this is I can only imagine on this eight to 10 year journey, how many times you thought of giving it up and doing something else or moving on or just questioning yourself. And the fact that you continue to be tenacious, you continue to network, you continue to put yourself out there. That's what kind of leads to uh, that. That's also that saying, the harder I work, the luckier I am like that day in day yeah. out effort versus if you had been like, Hey, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to strike it big in the next year. There's, very little chance that you'd still be here talking with me. You'd be doing something else. No, absolutely. And, and I think the other thing on that too is, um, you know, people really uh, like I, and again, this is not, but, but it's a, it's a question I like to ask when somebody, you know, I had a, a kid uh, just graduating high school. Uh, it was a friend of a family and, and he wanted to, to work in Hollywood. And, and I, I went to lunch with him and I said, do you want to do this or do you need to? And he said, well, I want to. And I go, okay, let me be more specific about the question. Like, do you, if you don't do this, like, it, will this, will this plague your life if you don't do, you know what I mean? Will you always wish you did this? Uh, well, yes. And I said, okay, then, then you need to, you don't want to. And uh, the reason I, I say want and need, it's, it's, Anything extremely difficult, um, in my opinion, want won't get you through it. It just won't. Uh, you need you have to have the need there to uh, to to get you through it because at some point your want is not going to be strong enough. Um, and 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 I think anyone who feels a need to do something um, don't don't ever put a timeline to success on something that you need to do in your life because it'll never go away. Uh, it'll never go away. And, and, and now here's the other part is I've had some success in what I've been doing and I just need to do more now. Like, you know, I, when, I, when I directed an episode, like that was a lifelong dream. And the day, the next day after it was over, I, I sat there and I went, wow, a dream came true, which doesn't happen very often, but, you know, but you're sitting there and I'm like, wow, a dream come true. And then I was like, well, what do you do when a dream comes true? And I was like, you know what? You dream bigger. Um, I need to dream bigger because that's my drive. That's my purpose, which I'll segue into. I don't think personally there is anything more important when you get out than finding a purpose. I, I, I'll take a Pepsi challenge with anyone if they think they can come up with something better. Finding your purpose after you're out, finding your new purpose in life, I believe is the single most important thing uh, that, that, that you need to do. Um, and then once you have it, so many other things, it's not going to be easy, but now, now the, the goal is there. You, you know what I mean? You know where to go. Um, and I think what happens to a lot of people is you have such an obvious per, uh, purpose when you're in and then when you get out, I think most people, quite frankly, don't know that they need to find their purpose. Um, and if you don't know that you need to do that, then, you know, some people it happens unintentionally. And again, as I said, I was lucky in that I had two things I wanted to do as a kid. So I was very lucky that way. Um, but, but I think finding, finding new purpose and, and finding, a, 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 you know, a real way forward, uh, is, you know, and, and in the military, the military gives you purpose. It tells you what your purpose is. It's like, Hey, here's in the military. It's like, here's your purpose. And here's all the steps. Here's the plan to get to your purpose. It's this, 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 or your goal, purpose, goal, similar. Whereas when you get out, it's like, okay, now, uh, you have no purpose. Uh, and even if you do, uh, we have no idea how to help you get there. You have no idea how to get there. No one will help you. And it's just this, um, you're swimming in this, um, in the middle of the ocean and, and you don't even know which way the boat is. I, I love that. I think that's really incredible. And I like this sense of 
recognizing an achievement of a lifelong dream and then challenging yourself to find your next mission, your next purpose, which I think is so vital. I think it's, it, uh, and I, I think you're right in the 350 interviews I've done for the podcast, finding your next mission, finding your next tribe, finding your next purpose. These yeah. are like all yeah. essential yeah. elements. And yeah. every um, time I hear every version of that, I'm like, yes. yeah, yeah. You're like, absolutely. And, um, I'm curious, you know, with, especially with CBS's SEAL team, like this, this led to um, roles for you in acting and in directing. What were both of those like? Uh, you know, it's funny. I, I, what, what I always want to do, I mean, to, to answer that, I, I got, you know, as, as a kid, um, I was fascinated with telling stories um, and or in seeing stories told and, you know, how I would tell a story and all these different things. And that's what Hollywood is. It's storytelling, you know. Um, and so what's really interesting is I just wanted to tell stories. Once I got to the actual industry and then I started, you know, um, seeing how the actual show, you know, how Hollywood works, um, every single, every single job on a set has a role in how the story's told told. Um, and, you know, for me, you know, like directing, acting, uh, I'm also a producer on the show. Like those are all different. They're different jobs, but they're different ways that the story is told. The director tells the story different than the way the actors tell it. And everyone, every single person on a show, movie, what have you, every single person comes together to tell the story overall. So for me, um, you know, I didn't really, my lifelong dream as a kid was to direct. That's what I wanted to do, like tell stories visually. Um, but then when I got the opportunity to be on camera, um, the ability to tell it as an actor was very interesting and, and something, you know, I didn't really understand how much, um, I, I hate to use the word power, but, but you know what I mean? It's like, you make the decision on how you are going to tell that character's story. So um, I thought that was, you know, it's, it's great. And I've learned a ton about directing by being on camera and working with such great actors, such experienced great actors. And um, it's at the end of the day, I am ridiculously lucky to essentially be doing something similar to my old job on camera now as an actor. So it's like, it's, it's fake. So but it still feels kind of like therapy in a way because I'm portraying something similar to my old job, but in a fake way now. So it's kind of like, I don't know, it's very odd. It's hard to explain, but I feel like, I feel like I'm still a kid playing, playing army, you know, after well, I did it for real, but now it's like, I feel like I'm still in that, you know, in that mode. I, I think what's so compelling is like, you know, what you said earlier, I thought the hospital analogy was great. The surgeon to nurse and then realizing you don't want to go and be in the hospital. And I could, I would probably do the exact same thing. I can imagine that. And then it's, it's kind of amazing the way that. I came back. Yeah. It's still part of your life, but in a very different way, in a way that I would have never have seen coming. And it, it incorporates elements of that and kind of keeps a toe in the water of that world while still being open to this completely new possibility. 100%. It's, it's the weirdest hybrid of, cause look, you know, I may have told myself, ah, oh, you know, I'm done. I'm, you know, I'm going to forget about that life. And quite frankly, I tried, I really did try. I, drank. I did freaking, I was hooked on opiates because of all the surgeries. I mean, I tried to erase my brain of the military. Um, it failed miserably and, um, I still missed it. So this has really quite frankly been therapy for me in the mm -hmm. sense that it's, like you said, it's kind of keeping my feet wet. Um, and I also do quite frankly feel that I get to do something for the, um, uh, uh, veterans and active duty, and then even a weirder group that we never think about future veterans, you know, which you never think about, but I get so many kids going, man, I love watching your show. I've wanted to join. It's the show I watch to motivate me to, to work out, to go. And, and I, it just, I was like, Holy crap. And then for me, everyone has their shows, their movies. But like when I was a kid, I watched a show called tour of duty, which was a Vietnam show. Whatever it started with paint it black. But uh, anyways, point being is I'm like, wow, this is some kid's tour of duty. And that just like blew my mind apart uh, because it, it actually is. It's, I feel like we're doing a recruiting commercial. Don't get me wrong. It's definitely, hey, look, 
jumping off a helicopter looks cool. It's never not going to look cool. But I think we, you know, it's, it's much more realistic in the sense that our characters have real issues. Um, we show how they get those issues. We show how they deal with those issues. And we show how those issues are, quite frankly, destroying them in a lot of ways. Um, we don't just show the cool parts of the action. We show the, the effect on the family and on the individuals at home. Um, and, and I'm very proud of that because, as I stated, I feel like it's a, we're, we're making a realistic recruiting video, you know, where people, look, it does look cool and you can do that job. And I know that there's some people that no matter what you say is going to happen, they're going to want to do that. Um, and as long as they know the stakes and the cost, then, then that's, that's fine. That's, that's what it should be. It should, we should be aware of, of what the reality is. Well, one thing I think is so exciting about your story is if we rewind back to 2005, 2007, I'll just make this up, but let's say that at that point in your life, your purpose was to serve your country, to defend your country. And we talked about this element of control, like you were doing that in one way. And if you had held on to that, I mean, who knows where things would have gone. But when you relinquished that control, when you accepted new possibilities, you're now serving, you're still serving that purpose. Like the, I completely buy into what you're saying. The impact that you're having on future veterans cannot be overstated. And I love this sense of how you've allowed yourself to translate into a, a new mission that is still serving that overall purpose and that we might not have ever sketched out if we were deliberately trying to get there. You know, I just think it's really amazing to see the power of that letting go. Yeah, no, letting go is so absolutely critical because we don't control anything. And, and you know, the, the irony too is that, you know, the highest end of combat, if you look at, you know, really, I mean, I have a buddy who's, God, he's, he's been in country. He has 10 years in country. That's deployed. Um, and obviously I won't say more about him, but, you know, I have these conversations with him. And what's really interesting is, you look at these these people at these extremely high Captain America like superhero type levels, and they accept that they have absolutely no control in combat. And you do what you do, but you don't control it. You just react to everything around you, and that that's what war is. It's it's about reacting, um, you know, acting as well. But you know what I'm saying? Like it's it's war. Like you don't control it. And the irony I think that's interesting about that is for whatever reason, for whatever reason. When you're in a war environment, you are at a certain point, you go, okay, I get that I don't have any control. Like you have to, if I die, I die. It's nothing. Do I go left or right? I, I just pick left because I have no control if it was the right or wrong choice. Yet for some reason, when we get out, we then think that we have control in our regular lives. Mm. The irony of that is what is war other than another side of life? We don't have control in anything. Like, you look at what's going on now, and I don't want to get wrapped up in it, but this, the virus stuff, like, you don't have control. Um, I mean, not saying that you should go swim outside of a shark tank, but my point being is, you know, there's some things, but at a certain point, you just have to accept that you, you do what you can do, um, but, but the effects to a large degree are, are, are not in your power. Um, and, and you just have to keep, you can't get wrapped up in trying to control everything because it's just gonna, um, it's not gonna lead to progress. Um, and the other thing too is how, like my injury is a great example of something that at the time, obviously it was the worst thing that ever happened to me, obviously. Now looking back, best thing that ever happened to me mm. by far. Mm. And uh, it's just interesting to me to see how many things in your life that go through this waveform of it was the worst thing, then the best thing, then the worst thing. Like any event in your life, like you do a breakup at the time, you're like, oh, it's the worst thing that's ever happened to me. Ten years later, you have a new love of your life, and you're like, man, that breakup was the best thing that ever happened to me. Hmm. Like we have to stop viewing our life as a constant, it's constantly changing. You, you know what I mean? And, and yep. you, your perspective on the past will change every day for the rest of your life. Yeah. Um, yep. And, and it, it has a good and a bad side effect. The good effect is it's, if you just take that time, you'll become a lot more stoic in how you view um, the present and the past because you don't know how it's going to work out 
in the future. Um, and, and it's just, uh, you don't control it either way. So just, you know, we're along for the ride. I love it. Is there anything you do? Do you take like, um, I, I always like to try to call out re, uh, resources or at least give people a sense of the things that the, the weights that you lift for your career. Do you take like acting classes? Do you watch, did you like learn about directing from things or read a book or podcast? Like what things have helped you on this journey? I mean, so I got again, super lucky in that I got thrown on camera, uh, and I got, uh, uh, you know, by advising on the show, and there's so many people that, that, you know, help me on the show, but I learned everything by being there. Like SEAL Team was my film school. I didn't, I don't have any formal education. I think I went to two acting classes years ago, but like I, when I was on camera acting, I would watch, you know, people who've been on camera for 25 years, David, Max, Neil, you know, AJ, all those people. And I'm just watching them act. And I was like, Hmm, okay, that's how they do it. You know? <laughs> and like I mean, day on day at this point, we're at 65 episodes. We're on, no, we're on episode 66 right now. So wow. over 66 episodes, I've watched, you know, all the directors and all the actors and I've just tried to learn from them um, and, 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 and mimic and then combine that with a passion of really studying what they do and, and wanting to do it. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, when I tried to, um, when I tried to kind of go back to the theoretical, like uh, a film book or, a, or even an acting book or even an acting classes, the couple that I said I did, they were, they were so theoretical that I really couldn't, I, I, I was like, but that's not how it works. Like the theory is cool, but like, and, and not to, to, I, I never went to college. Um, not even when I got out and, it just wasn't for me and not saying that some, you know, but it wasn't for me. And I'm the type of person, if you like, you know, for me, I'm the kind of person just put me in that environment and let me see what the system is. Let me see how it's done. And I'll learn that way. I love it. Sitting down a class, you know, it's just different yeah. people. Different ways. No, I love knowing your learning style and playing to that. Um, I know that we're short on time, but I'd love to give room for, um, for anyone who listening is interested in Hollywood in general or film or television or anything like that. And they're, they're in the military. What, what other advice do you have for them about pursuing this sort of career path? Um, you know, it, that's a great question. And it kind of goes back to, to what I said earlier. And that is, um, you know, do not, do not try to be an advisor. <laughs> um, and, and the reason I say that is because, I mean, I did it wrong, uh, but I didn't know better. But now knowing better, don't do what I did. And here's why. is because, A, think of the amount of movies. Let's say, you know, a thousand. I'm just using a number. There's a thousand projects going on right now. How many of those are military? Let's say 20. Of those 20, you have 50 advisors that have already been here, already connected, already have experience they are fighting over those jobs. So your odds of getting in off the street are almost zero. Um, and, and the worst case or the best case is you'll get hired by one of them and then you'll work underneath them and then you'll always be their guy or girl, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So what I would say is, and, I, and again, I've never met the person, but I think who did a phenomenal job is Adam Driver. Mm -hmm. Adam Driver is a Marine or was a Marine or is it, a Marine because they're always Marines. So uh, <laughs> no, my, my girlfriend's a Marine. I'm making a joke, but um, my point being is he was a Marine and he became an actor and he's still a Marine, but he didn't say I I'm, I'm a, I'm a Marine. He said, I'm an actor who happened to be a Marine. You have, again, going back to, you have to become that, that job. If you want to be an actor, then act. The fact that you're a veteran is awesome, but that's not the current job. Do you see what I'm saying? Like yeah. you have to be good at that skill, work at that skill. And then your status as a veteran is a bonus. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, whereas once you say you're a military advisor, a, you can only work on military projects and B the way the industry looks at you, they will only think that, you know, like the way most advisors work, they don't listen to a single thing that they say outside of advising because quite frankly, until you've done those other jobs, you don't know. Yep. You don't know how the set works. You don't know the logistics of all these things. So um, 
figure out what skill you want to do on set or, or in the industry, and then really work at, at learning that skill, being good at that skill, and then come out and be that job, actor, producer, director, whatever it is. Um, and the veteran is, is, is the feather in your hat that, uh, you know, it, it's a status that's great and it adds a great work ethic and all these different things. But the only way you're going to be hired is to be by being good at that job that they're hiring you for. Mm. Well, Tyler, I appreciate your, uh, your advice today. I feel like um, certainly relevant for people interested in Hollywood, but I feel like the things you're hitting on are relevant for every career path and just so honored to have you on the show and appreciating the voice that you have in this. No, thank, thank you so much for having me. It was great. Uh, you know, transitioning veterans. I, I don't think that there's anything more important uh, right now, especially than, than helping veterans transition. And, and, and the one last thing I'll say, cause I think it's really important is Gosh, it drives me crazy when so many people get transition advice that are from people who are still in. Yeah. Like, ah, yep. but you yep. haven't done, you know, all the transition offices, the people are still in. It's like, talk to somebody who's out. And a thing I always say is never take advice from someone who isn't where you want to be. Mm, I love it. You know what I mean? Because that's yep. where you're going to get, you're going to get where they are. So thank you so much for having me. I truly appreciate it. Beyond the Uniform is written and produced by me, Justin Nasiri, with help from our Chief of Staff, Steve Bain, and our editor, Kathleen Dillon. We are an all-volunteer organization and would greatly appreciate your help in any of the following ways. First, spread the word. Beyond the Uniform has over 330 podcast episodes and 15 on-demand webinars, all offered for free. Help us spread the word on social media, at military bases, or whatever gets this resource in front of more men and women who need it. Positive reviews on iTunes go a long way towards this as well. Second, sponsorship. Beyond the Uniform relies on sponsorship to keep us going. There is so much more we'd like to do, but we don't have nearly the resources to do so. If you know of a company that would like to advertise in any way with Beyond the Uniform, please send them to beyondtheuniform.org. Third, donations. If you're in a financial position to donate, you can find more information on the support section of beyondtheuniform.org. At our website, beyondtheuniform.org, you'll also find 330-plus episodes categorized by industry, functional role, and more. You'll find a link for live events, typically four per month. You'll also find both free and for purchase books that take a deeper dive on topics related to career growth. Thank you for your support as we aim to help members of the military and their families thrive in their post-military career and life.